think are revenue management tools, while maybe not as robust as other things in the market, is the most accurate read on how the market's moving over the next year, right? Like, where are those blips in demand? What is the current occupancy rate? What do you think that occupancy rate will be when we get here? Like, should you hold out? Should you get rid of it? Should you price it higher or lower? Like, that's all super important, right? If you're running a business, how you're pricing those that asset is, I think is the name of the game, right? Like that really separates the winners and the losers in this game, in my opinion. This is episode number 6-3 of the Short-Term Rental Success Stories podcast. Are you an investor that's looking to have your home professionally managed? Go to cohostit.com for more information. Welcome back to Short-Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journeys in starting and growing their short-term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that'll help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five-star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes and let us know what you enjoy as it really helps support the show. If you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation, to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Host Nation? I am super excited to be back again with you this week. This has been a super exciting week because just a few days ago, I finished uh, a conference called Veterans Live where I was able to speak with other military members and other people that are in the veteran space about short-term rental investing. So I created a new presentation trying to just take everything about short-term rental investing and this whole concept that we call the RCB model of investing and teach it to these veterans. So I only had 30 minutes to be able to do this. So I was talking very fast, but uh, the feedback that I got from everybody that was at this conference was amazing. And what we've decided to do is I've actually updated our masterclass. So for those of you that don't know, my business partner, mentor, and friend, John Bell, who is also the co-host of another podcast that we have called the Vacation Rental Machine Podcast. And in this podcast, we've been teaching people how to be able to create a vacation rental machine, a business that's able to run on autopilot using other people's properties. So the whole model that we teach is this concept called RCB investing, where we're utilizing things like rental arbitrage, co-hosting and buy and hold, and able to operate all of this within the same type of business framework. We have some really unique ways of how we're utilizing rental arbitrage and co-hosting in our own business. And we've decided to be able to teach other people how to do that. So that's what I taught on this training to these veterans. And they were just like mind blown. So like I said, we've decided to update our masterclass where John and I are actually teaching you these different concepts. Now, there's a lot more in this training. It's actually a 90 minute training where we go over quite a lot of things such as RCB investing, the four pillars of recession resistance and how you can actually take your short-term mental business and make it recession resistant based off the things that we're teaching. We also go over the 10 steps of the vacation rental machine formula, which is everything that you need if you plan on scaling or starting this business. And at the end of the training, we also give a free gift, which is our 10 step Airbnb startup to scale checklist. So if you're just starting off or you are scaling or looking to diversify your short-term mental portfolio, This training is taking everything that you need to know in this business, putting it all into a very condensed and just action oriented, fast paced training where you can just take away so much. And we also give you a resource at the end that you can use for yourself in your own business. If you'd like to attend that training, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash masterclass and you can actually register for that recorded training where we go over a lot of different things. So it's super, super powerful. And I'm excited to be able to hear your feedback. Just let me know what you like about the training or if there's anything that you think could be improved. I am always open to feedback. Now, this conversation was actually recorded prior to COVID-19 and I withheld uploading it just because of how we were pivoting the podcast and some of the different content that we were putting out. But I feel like now it's an appropriate time because we're also looking into different markets and looking to invest Right now, markets are starting to recover to where they used to be. And if you actually want to follow John and I as we go over in detail, looking at market recovery, you can also listen to our Vacation Rental Machine podcast, where in the next episode, we're actually going to be doing market research and identifying markets that are recovering and analyzing properties in those types of markets. But because bookings are starting to come back and markets are starting to recover, this is actually a perfect time to be able to introduce Scott Shatford. Scott is the founder and CEO of AirDNA. AirDNA has over 10,000 active subscribers and analyzes over 10 million properties. 
Scott was actually a host himself prior to starting AirDNA. We actually get to hear Scott's story about how he started and how he was actually teaching people how to be able to start their own short-term rental businesses. And then Scott went on to found AirDNA with all of the market research that he was doing for his own properties. So Scott had eight short-term rental properties in the Santa Monica, California area until 2015 when they were shut down because of regulations. With 15 years of experience as a data analyst, Scott realized he wanted to discuss data instead of just purchasing or subleasing properties. So in this episode, Scott talks about what rental arbitrage looked like in 2012, how AirDNA started. He also talks about how AirDNA pulls their information and what kind of information you can expect seeing on the platform. We also discuss how you can utilize the information on AirDNA to run a successful short-term rental business. If you like my show notes for this episode, go to shorttermsage.com backslash str63. Or if you like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, Host Nation, to another episode of Short Term Mental Success Stories. In this episode, I have the special, special honor of speaking with the one and only Scott Shatford. Scott, if you please wouldn't mind introducing yourself and let us know who you are and what inspired you to get into short term rentals. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me, Julian. Um, yeah, I'm Scott Shatford, uh, founder and CEO of AirDNA.co. Um, been in the data analytics game for the last five years, but for the couple few years before that, I was pretty early in on the rental arbitrage game. So I had about eight properties in Santa Monica from 2012 to 2015 uh, before they shut me down. But I'm sure we get into all of those fun details here in the show. So, so rental arbitrage in 2012, what, what did that look like when you first started? Was that a, a common term or is this just pretty, was that pretty uh, new back then? It definitely wasn't a common term, right? It was, it was really easy business back in the day, which was the beautiful thing. Um, but we didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't know really how to think about this whole world. And it was fun. I mean, it was definitely sort of at the trailblazer side of this thing. Um, and so there's lots of, learning lots of failing and uh but it was a really interesting time to be in the business because it was right when you could sort of just throw anything on airbnb and demand was so much outpacing the supply in the marketplace and the prices were so much lower than what the hotels were charging especially around big events and it was just it was the easy golden times as i like to think of them when it was just it was easy the expectations were a lot lower everybody was sort of doing it for the first time and it was a time when the uh, you didn't have to think as hard, I think, as you do now. It's just a much more competitive space. Expectations are a lot higher. Um, and so I think it just you know, continues to get more difficult as there's more professionalization in the space. So when you first started, uh, it wasn't super popular. Like you said, you could throw really any property up there. And as long as it was you know, a better looking place or a little bit better priced, you could, you could uh, do pretty well. When, when did it start to become a little bit more competitive? And when did you realize like, oh, I can't just pick up any property and, and throw it on there? Or do you still think that that's still the case? I, I don't think it's the case anymore. And I think it was really just when the reviews started to suffer, right? It was essentially the same property, the same decorations, the same you know, decent seeing the, you know, the towels and the cleaning and everything like that. But the reviews were sort of like slowly getting worse and worse and worse. And just the expectations for just like cleanliness were the first thing that got me. Like it was sort of you're staying in somebody's apartment and you deal with a little bit of like, whatever, this isn't a hotel property. Um, but people, you know, after a couple of years, they were just expecting it to be as clean as, you know, a hotel property. They were expecting the linens not to have any stains on them or the towels to be perfectly white, right? And it was sort of at that stage, I was like, oh, this is definitely getting more difficult. I can't sort of clean this place myself or like sort of, you know, mail this port part in and I, and I need to get more professional about who I'm having in here to do turnovers uh, was, was part of it. Um, you know, I wrote a whole book on the subject, you know, that Airbnb Experts Playbook back in 2014, which is sort of all my learnings and about just being a nerd in short term rentals. And I'm sure you can appreciate that. But, you know, so it was all about how do I had to market it, you know, pricing became more competitive. Um, you know, just, just everything that goes into having a more crowded marketplace. You got to stand out somehow, right? You can't just be another place with the same stuff. You got to figure out like, what is your unique niche or how are you going to market to the musicians coming to town or families? Or like, you just have to think a little bit harder about how to market your place and really keep the same level of numbers uh, over time. 
So when you were picking up these properties, were you just like finding anything or did you have the type of mindset that you have now with, you know, you you have over 10 million properties that you're pulling data from. But when you were just starting off in Santa Monica uh, with these eight, I mean, what were you doing to be able to tell like this is going to be a profitable property? Yeah, that's, it's a good question. I was I was fortunate enough to really be at one of these super hot spots for short term rentals. So I was the the brief story is you know I was I I was living in Santa Monica right in the middle of the Third Street Promenade, which is like this massive tourist destination. All the hotels are five hundred bucks a night around that area at the time. And I went on vacation. My neighbor told me about Airbnb. I was like, what's that? Cool. Took some pictures of my iPhone, went over to Bangkok and like listed on our Airbnb. And I was like 95% booked for the four months I was on that trip. And I was charging 300, 280 a night for the property. And I was making like $8,000 plus on a $3,000 rent, maybe another $500 all in. And so there's this massive arbitrage opportunity, right? And like, I didn't know that was the word for it maybe at the time. Um, but there was this sort of the light bulb moment at that point in time. It was like, how am I making 4,000 bucks a month while being in like Bali? Um, this is too easy. Um, and so I didn't at that time have to think too hard about where to go. I knew that I could probably open 10 places next door and have similar success. Um, and so that's kind of what I did, right? It was just like Santa Monica is great. Hotels are expensive. People can't afford to go where they want to, so they go stay in like some other part of LA and take the train in or whatever. Um, so that part was easy um, to open up my first eight. You know, it was just sort of replicate what I knew was working. And sort of the genesis of Air DNA started when I was thinking about, okay, I got to diversify. I got to get out of Santa Monica. Things are looking weird with the government. Like this, they seem like they might be doing something fishy. And just as any good business owner, you want to diversify your investments. And so that's when I started looking, you know, down in Orange County or up in Santa Barbara. And that was when the genesis of Air DNA I was, you know, okay, now I need to start looking all through California and then the US for where is this arbitrage opportunity the, the highest? Um, and then during the exploration phase, talking to a bunch of other Airbnb entrepreneurs, you know, that was sort of the light bulb, like, well, why not just go sell the data uh, instead of going and buying properties? I don't have a hospitality background. I don't have a real estate background. I got a data background. So why don't I do the smart thing and do, and do a data business instead? So you were looking uh, to I got expanding your rental arbitrage business and you were looking at all these different areas. Uh, what was the type of data that you were pulling? Because uh, obviously now you have like a full team and you're, you're pulling all this data that's available uh, that Airbnb kind of like, I guess, has in the back. Uh, but you were scraping this probably manually. What, what were you doing to be able to find good deals? Yeah, it's, it's very similar to what we're doing today, to be honest. Right? It's just trying to understand exactly what a property is revenue occupancy and rate is that they're trying to char charge, right? It's the, sort of the three basic hospitality metrics. You can throw in ref par, which is sort of the, the, the one metric that sort of matters, but it's just a, uh, a combination of ADR and occupancy. Um, and that's what I was trying to get to, right? If you look at a calendar, you know, I was looking at calendars, looking how book, far book they were three months in advance, right? And that's sort of what everybody does, looking at like spying on the competition. Um, but you know, what did they do the last three months? Or like, how likely are those other you know those other forty days in their calendar to get booked? You know, so you know if you do it once, you can write down an Excel spreadsheet and do that scale and do it over a course of a year to really understand exactly what a property was doing. Um, that was the hard part, and so things were actually easier back in the day because you could look back a year in a calendar in the API, like scraping it, hitting the API. You could look at like, you know, last year, a month and see what uh, was available, what was not available. Um, the life isn't that easy anymore um, where they don't show anything beyond yesterday. Like you can't look at yesterday anymore, right? And so it was pretty easy. You just go look at the last 12 months. You would sort of look at how many reviews they were, how many reviews they were getting on a monthly basis. Say, this looks like a full-time rental. Full time rental. This guy's doing a pretty decent job. He's got some revenue management in place. You know, it seems like he's doing all right. And then you sort of select that as like top 20% of performers, full time properties. And then you would just look at um, kind of what their unavailability was and sort of just model what, what the revenues probably were from that property. Um, so that we would do that on every single property listed on the platform. Um, you know, it was only a few hundred thousand at the time in the US. And so, yeah, just kind of back into it. And then you can sort of overlay that, right? And Zillow was the easiest place to get that data. They got a free open. You can go to zillow.com forward slash research, I think. And it just got like, here's 
every zip code, one bedroom property, and nine zero four zero six is do you know cost this much money. Um, and so you can just do a really quick overlay of the uh, Airbnb revenue versus the cost of the properties and sort of see what jumps off the page. Were were you looking for like a certain type of um, a certain type of number? Like if you saw that you know if you were looking on Zillow and there was a property for rent, let's just say in California, it's you know three thousand dollars, but you saw that these properties were renting you know on Airbnb for let's say six. Were you looking for a certain number, or how how are you determining like this is going to be actually a really good deal? It, it was all relative to me at the time, right? I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if like two times is good or three times is good, or maybe there was four times somewhere, right? I mean, but really I was looking at three times the time. So I could do three times the rent, best case scenario. I think that's come down in expectations. It's just there's more data out there. You know, shame on me for publishing all the data. So like people know the good markets now. Um, so there's not as many amazing up and coming hotspots that nobody knows about. Um, so I think like in the two to two and a half times long term, re- or, you know, rental is kind of what people are looking for these days. I think three is is pretty hard to find unless you're taking some crazy risk in legal ish areas, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's a lot of the opportunities are. Unfortunately, is you know you got to figure out. I think a lot of people like if they're in New York or if they're in places where like you can make a killing, just don't expect to have your doors open a year from now. And it's only places that you can sort of expect to get maybe still three times uh, long term revenue, long term revenue. And I and I know uh, you guys do a really good job. Like you just recently published an article about some of the uh, top places compared from rent to uh, to what the actual profit on Airbnb is. Uh, with that article, though, is uh, I don't know if you if you were the one to write it or if you were involved, but uh, are those things taking into account like like regulations? Like if New York is on there, um, is that specific to I guess that has to be in relative to where the regulations are, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not super intimately familiar with the post. Um, regulate, it, it really is a simple calculation for that post. But you know, if like San Francisco or New York pops into like the top place to buy, you know, we sort of like get rid of it. Um, but it's not really a systematic rating system that says these are the best rental arbitrage opportunities thinking about regulation. Because regulation, you know, one, it would be outdated six months from now if we did that article. One, it's very nuanced. Two, there could be homeowners associations or other things in some of these markets would make it totally legal. And so we found, you know, just for having something that's evergreen content, like it's best not to include regulation because it's, it's outdated as soon as you write it. Um, that being said, you know, we're being much more thoughtful about how we can gather that information because we know from, especially the investor community, it's almost now regulation first, opportunity second, um, and there needs to be somebody that's that's publicly doing this because we know. You know, but Costa has got a team of like, you know, dozens of people just looking at regulation. And a lot of these other big firms do too, because that's really the name of the game now is understanding what the regulations are, what maybe the loopholes are in that regulation, um, and how to have sustainable supply in those markets. Do you have to get a hospitality license or, you know, what, what, what are the workarounds like in terms of like commercial zoning or other things like that? Um, so yeah, I think we're being thoughtful about how to approach that in the future, but it's not in that current article. When, when you first started uh, scraping for this data, were you just using Airbnb? Because now um, you're, you're also with AirDNA, you pull from like Homeway Verbo, um, but you're not accounting for, for all sites, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we, we, well, one is just how accurate can we get the data, right? And there's some things about some of the other platforms, how much unique supply you're going to get if you get off of Airbnb and Verbo. Like, what if you're not listing on one of those two, like, you're probably not doing that great unless you are. Like a hotel style property that's good on booking.com, um, or maybe a mega mansion doing you know over ten thousand dollars a night, you know, may not might not be on two one of those two platforms. But the majority, let's call it 90% of relevant supply in the US is gonna be on one of those two platforms. And so once you start getting more platforms and you know matching them together and trying to figure it all out, you know, the it becomes more complex. You're sort of pulling a lot more. Um, data sources. And so we're focused on those two at the moment. Probably no plans in the immediate future to sort of go beyond those, those two players. So, so when people are interested uh, in using AirDNA, like you said, there's people that are, are investing into these properties, uh, but the data that is being pulled from AirDNA, it's just kind of like, what is it? Just the average? If you could kind of explain how is AirDNA pulling this information and a person that is maybe going to be investing into a property, uh, what type of information can they be expecting to be pulled uh, from, from the platform? 
Yeah, I mean, we can get into the intricacies of how it all works. Um, so it really is looking at every single property's availability in the world every single day and looking at the changes to the, that calendar, right? And so we will ping every calendar in the world. We'll see, okay, hey, next weekend was available yesterday, but not available today. And the last available rate was three ninety nine. dollars Let's call it on all three days, right? We take that data, we throw it through our algorithm, and that algorithm says, it spits out, is that a reservation or is that the owner blocking it or is that like a same day booking block or like, you know, goes through all these like things and says, that looks like a reservation. Based off the host, you know, performance, they have seven properties, they've been on the platform for three years, the average length of stay is typically three days in that market, 20 different things it goes through to say, okay, that's a reservation. Um, you know, we we're able to build this algorithm and the only people to build the algorithm with this quality is because back in 2015, when we started AirDNA, is because Airbnb had a bit of an oversight in their system and was actually revealing all the reservations on the platform for about six months. And so at that point in time, we were capturing about 20 million actual reservations, knew exactly the length of stay is, how far in advance they were booked. And so we were able to sort of then, when they shut that down in October 2015, build an algorithm. Now, we also have partnerships with 300,000 properties that give us their daily booking information. We get iCals from tens of thousands of people. So we get all this data from all these different sources say, hey, you know, what does a booking look like in Myrtle Beach, right? And with this person. And so it's all, it's all pretty science -y these days. Uh, I got a good data science team and everyone had figured out how to do this on my own, that's for sure. So is it is it pretty pretty confident for people that are coming into this space? Um, let's say they are interested in rental arbitrage and they're looking up a market. Um, let's say there's not a lot of properties in that area, though. How how is AirDNA able to give numbers if there just maybe isn't a, a lot of information in a particular area? Yes, yeah, good question. So you know what what can you so sample size is. is you know, we're not going to get every property perfect, right? Some some properties are just weird, right? There's a consultant and he stays at his house every weekend and he rents it out every Monday through Wednesday, right? Like the algorithm's going to break on that. It's just, it's just an outlier. It doesn't make sense, right? So there's always going to be outliers no matter how you sort of try to solve this problem. So if you get to a small sample size, it can be an issue. But, you know, I think if you got over 10 properties, well, there's enough. There's enough there to give you a good read on that market, how those properties are doing. Because what we do is we extrapolate. The biggest problem in this space is that a short-term rental might be a short-term rental for seven days out of the entire year, right? And how much do you want to extrapolate from that one week of bookings to say, this property would have earned $72,000 if it was available full-time. Um, but we do do a lot of that, saying, okay, that's a little bit of a read and a property's booked for 30 days and that's a little bit of a read. And so we can take like small sample sizes and make pretty good predictions on like what that property would earn full time to get a bigger sort of sample set, even in small markets. Um, but I say there's, if there's over like 20 properties, I mean, I feel pretty good about what, what the read on the, on the data says. So, so uh, just, just to kind of recap what you're saying is like, if there's an area where regulations are really strict, uh, if people just see other people listed on Airbnb, maybe they don't realize that there are regulations. So they purchase their DNA, uh, air DNA is going to be showing them, based off of uh, what the property will do during that period where they're only listed? Or is this um, like a general f for the whole year? Uh, let's say it's only listed, you know, you're only able to list for six months. Sure. No, that's good. And I, I will uh, try to be clear. I live in the data all day. Uh, so there's, on, on our side, if you go to a, a city, right? And you, what you'll see in the map is basically us saying, here's the property. Here's how many days it was available over the last year. Here's the occupancy rate, ADR, and here's how much revenue we think that, that property generated. That will be our estimates of what that property did over the last 12 months. No, no like additional round, you know, rounding up for days that it wasn't available or doing any like special magic there. You know, on our rentalizer product or revenue potential that we put together that like really analyzes every single market and says, you know, let's do this match mash up between Zillow and Airbnb. Day. We do a lot of this sort of, you know, rounding up because this property is only available for three months. It's only available for Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest and Christmas. Like, okay, how much realistically would this have made if it was available the whole year in the dead of the heat, you know, when nobody wants to go to New Orleans, right? And so that's a lot of the sort of the, the math magic going on to understand market performances is that, especially when looking at, uh, the arbitrage opportunities. 
so so if you were to have if you were to tell somebody or uh, help someone to get into investing into the space, when do you think is a good time to be uh, purchasing AirDNA or starting to really dive into the numbers? Should they be looking at the numbers straight away or should they be doing other things before they start diving into how profitable an area might be? Yeah, I mean, I say, hey, we got a lot of good block content. Like, we're not trying to put this all behind the lock and key. You know, we, we're the rental arbitrage content that you just talked about. We're spending a month working on the best places to buy properties. I really want to make this interesting deep dive into regulation, into management, into like the differences between the long term rental, short term rental. How do you do a calculator? How do you really forecast expenses? You know, so like, I really, so we really are into giving away a lot of this good information for the beginner. Um, like where to, where to target the right market and how to think about the right type of property that is maybe better for short-term rental and long-term rental or better or undervalued because in a bad school district, we're in short-term rental, you're not sending your kids to school, so it doesn't matter, right? So some of those cool insights, you know, so I definitely go to the blog and check that out when you're just sort of thinking about the investing, like where to go, where's the best cap rates, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, we really do think about market minder really being an operational tool right and we know that people want to benchmark the performance did i have a terrible winter or is everybody going to have a terrible winter that's really insightful when you're saying you know general market slowdown versus i need to pick up my game and get more competitive i need to buy some new furniture i need to do better dynamic pricing whatever that is we want to help people price their properties we want to help people be able to get more people to their platform, right? With like rentalizing and different tools. Here's how much we think your property would do as a vacation rental. We're guarantee you 80% of that revenue if you come to us, right? So we really think of ourselves as an operator tool and not an investor tool, but 30% of our subscribers are investors. <laughs> so, you know, there's definitely a big use case for that to like think about underwriting a new property and think about estimating what this new investment would do um, you know, there is a, there's a lot of use cases for the investor. So we do a lot of residential um, real estate investors on the platform as well. But we're, our sort of our roadmap is more of this all-encompassing revenue management, market intelligence, benchmarking, all those sorts of tools all in one so you can really understand your market and how, you, how you're performing against your market. You know, a lot of people are are looking at the short term rental space and they're saying, man, there, there's there's a lot of potential here. And AirDNA is it's really kind of like the first tool that people think of when it's like, how do I get a good idea? Uh, you know, before, like when you first started out, you were scraping for the data manually going into the Airbnb and looking at the calendars. You know, now we have the luxury of having a tool uh, to be able to help us give uh, more accurate information, but there is a lot of money. A lot of people are investing their, their life savings, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of energy. Um, how is, is air DNA, uh, a tool that you can just solely depend on, or are there other things that you should be doing to be able to help you come up with a good, uh, investment strategy? Purposely, we don't really do a lot side outside of the short term rental data, right? If we really want to get into like the best investment side of things, like helping people get the property, get the agent, get the insurance, get the lender, find the property manager. Like we would go down that path, right? So there's a lot to do outside of just understanding where to go and what type of asset to look for. And so, yeah, you got to go to a lot of different places, right? You got to find out like, okay, maybe Biloxi, Mississippi is the best place, but oh, there's no good manager in Biloxi or whatever it is. Like there's still a lot of legwork. We don't do the regulation homework for you. So, you know, we are one data point at, at the moment. You know, do, we think, we know we're the best data point, um, but we also know this isn't like an API to Airbnb. If it was that easy, you know, we wouldn't be as valuable as we are, right? Because we're doing a lot of the hard work that you just can't do or wouldn't do quite as accurately yourself. But are there are there errors in some of the data? You know, are there those outliers for sure? And so you should, you know, kick the tires a little bit, make sure that it makes sense. Make sure that one bedroom apartment, you know, isn't really doing four hundred thousand dollars a year. That doesn't make sense. We try to catch those, but there'll always be some of those outliers. So I think from a data perspective, you know, I think we try to solve the full suite of problems. Um, but it's not just a data problem you're trying to solve. And you said with with um, you said previously with, with managing. Um, is this because you came from a rental arbitrage uh, type of background, and a lot of the people that know about AirDNA, it's through uh, this space, uh, but co-hosting and managing other people's properties, uh, being a short rental property manager is something that uh, a lot of people also want to get into. Is this a tool that uh, property managers can utilize to be able to, um, uh, for for their clients, if they were to analyze a property, uh, is this something that they can be using as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's great for you know co-hosts, and, and I should probably know more about that whole business model than I do. Um, but it's it's great when you can talk to somebody and say, hey, you know, here's what you're doing. Here's what the market's doing, right? Here's what I think, you know, with my expertise, I can get you another 25% of revenue on this property. You know, you're going to make more money. I'm going to make money. We're all going to be happy at the end of the day, right? So to be able to prove that out with some different properties, with some different comp sets and say, here's what we think this property could do, even if it has no rental history. I think that's super important for getting new customers on board. You know, and we really think our revenue management tools while maybe not as robust as other things in the market, is the most accurate read on how the market's moving over the next year, right? Like, where are those blips in demand? How are the competitors pricing during those blips? What is the current occupancy rate? What do you think that occupancy rate will be when we get here? Like, should you hold out? Should you get rid of it? Should you price it higher or lower? Like, that's all super important, right? If you're running a business, how you're pricing those that asset is, is I think, is the name of the game, right? Like, that really separates... The winners and the losers in this game, in my opinion. So we have a lot of really good forward-looking stats on when you can really crank up rates, when you need to get rid of properties, like you know, low season, just get rid of it nine months in advance, be the bottom 20 percentile pricing, just get rid of it. It's, it's, you're gonna have 20 percent occupancy and it's not gonna be your property. So just get rid of it. So like some of those insights are super helpful just on the revenue management side of things, which I think is half the battle in, in, in running a good business here. And, and that's one of the things that you guys are actually moving into now, too, is you're getting into the uh, dynamic pricing? Yeah, we are getting into dynamic pricing. Um, and, you know, we don't, people don't want to think that hard, right? The average co-host doesn't have an economics degree or not a mathematician, right? And so they don't want to think about, like, you know, supply curves and, and they don't want to think about that stuff, right? And so we know the person just wants to have it plugged into Airbnb and just the, the rate pushed. And, you know, it seems like a simple problem to solve, but... You know, people have different needs and desires from properties. Uh, some markets operate weird. Like, long story short, we are in, we do have recommended rates. So if you come to our website, you upload your iCal, we will spit out what we think is the best rate for your property over the next six months. Um, you know, a lot of data science behind that. We feel pretty good about it in most markets. We launched it in fifty thousand markets our first day, and we're about six months into it. So. It's definitely still a learning curve. We're trying to figure out where it's doing well, where it's not doing well. But as sort of being free and included in MarketMinder, you know, you know, where people get it for twenty bucks a month, you know, in, in some markets, it's definitely worth checking out and seeing if it makes sense to you. You know, you're pulling all of this data. Is is AirDNA a little bit more, would you say it's more accurate when there's a lot of properties within a particular area? So let's say something like Miami, where there's a wide range of people that are maybe listing properties for very cheap uh, to very expensive. Does that, do you, does that maybe skew the data? Or if someone's just looking at one particular number, let's say it's like, you know, 160, but the price ranges from like, you know, $40 up to, you know, a thousand, how, how does somebody know like w what they could be pricing their property for? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question, right? Um, and so for the purposes of revenue management, right? So let's say you are in, so you're in a market. It doesn't really matter how many properties you have, right? The, I think the hardest part is trying to say, what is the quality of my property versus my competitive set? And how do you want to define that competitive set? You know, it's probably not going to be every property in Miami. You know, you got to get down to the proper zip code and say, okay, hey, you know, maybe two and three bedrooms if you're looking at both of those because we both accommodate seven to nine people, whatever it may be. And so then at that point, you know, you need to figure out where you think your property fits into the spectrum, right? Are you exactly average? Is your place just like sort of the average property in that market? And that's fine. That is how it is, you know, a lot of times. Or, or are you sort of a more exclusive luxury property in that comp set? And so that's some of the sort of the, the research you have to do is looking at those comps, saying, "Hey, you know, I think I'm on the upper scale. I think you know people on the average are charging 240. I think I'm you know the 75th percentile sort of a property, and that's my band. That's my range. Those are my people, right? I need to follow those people around the pricing game. Um, and so that's sort of the only thought that you know when you're looking at our tool without loading up your property and us doing that analysis for you. That's that's the sort of thought process you need to go through." So if you're in the 75th percentile, it means, you know, hey, I'm better than 75% of the properties, 75% out of 100 properties. And so that, that's, you know, that's sort of the only thing that the user has to say, like, be honest with themselves and say, like, you know, how, what is the quality of my property? The recommended rate section is a whole different story. We geeked out on that forever about how to analyze historical performance, booking lead times, price, 
all that stuff is sort of scale up where we think you are within a comp set and define three different comp sets and do a bunch of stuff. I think we probably over geeked out on it. And so we're just trying to figure out how to, how to strip it down a little bit and still get the same performance out of it. But um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So, so from what, from what it sounds like you are when you're, you know, because when you when you go to AirDNA and you're just using the free the free version, uh, which is probably what a lot of people do, um, you know, they look at like the average daily rate and in a particular area, and but that doesn't tell you like you know what's the size of the property or um, you know what what type of quality property it is. Uh, so when people are looking at this, you know, it, it might be challenging for them to be able to know like, hey, I'm looking at a property that's renting for you know uh, two thousand dollars a month. Am I going to be able to make a profit? Um, but it's until you start using the com uh, comparables by finding people that are within a certain tier is how you're able to identify if it's going to be uh, uh, well-priced. Yeah. I mean, it's all, you know, very intentional in the product. You know, it is helpful for somebody just trying to understand the general marketplace. But, you know, you're not going to go spend 5000 or $500,000 without really understanding the comp sets, how to drill down to the relevant properties you know, to get to the bedrooms and bathrooms is all sort of the paid version of the product, right? So yeah, I mean, we want to be able to share a bunch of data to get people excited about the short-term rental market. But in order to get actionable information out of the tool, you know, you got to pull out your credit card, unfortunately. That's, that's good. That's good. And uh, are there are there people, are there like any, like what, what type of people are using this data? Is this like something that just smaller uh, investors are using or are there like really big players that are uh, utilizing AirDNA to be able to help them make decisions? Like uh, I know there's a lot of companies out there like um, there's like Sonder and Lyric and they're, you know, picking up these large apartment complexes. Are they using the same type of data or are they uh, doing something different? It's the same data. So, you know, those guys, Sonder, Vicasa, all big customers, and, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those guys. Um, that are our customers. The, I think the only difference is, is that you know, for our, our market minor product, you know, most of these you know small time operators or co-hosts, you know, they don't have a data science team to do these pretty visualizations, right? So we give you the package reports. I thought through the data was the most interesting, and I, you know, we put it into a pre-packaged thing for you. You know, can you drill into every single property's details? Can you export it? Can you do your own custom stuff? No, right? And that's why these bigger companies want the raw data is because they want to build their own visualizations. They want to mash that up with other data sets they have about new construction, new home construction, right? And so they're doing their own stuff with the data. I think the only difference is, you know, market miners is a visualization tool and they're just sort of getting raw data to incorporate into whatever data sets they have, whatever pricing algorithms they're developing. But in, at its core, essentially, it's the same exact data just being presented uh, to the user in market miners. How important do you see data being, you know, like when you first started out, like you said, you, you could pick up any property and, you know, throw it online and you you were able to make a profit. Uh, but like you said, now uh, you're looking at a lot of people are trying to do like, you know, double the note value. Do you see um, where do you see data and moving forward as more people start coming into the space? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. I mean. I don't think it really, I don't really know if, know if I see it changing a whole lot in the future. I mean, I think as it is more competitive, you know, as there are more people in the market, you know, the hospitality is really cyclical, right? And we've been blessed to be in a, in a cycle, which is 12 years of like straight, you know, up and to the right, right? And that doesn't happen forever, right? And so I think where a lot of people have been able to have the luxury of not being particularly data driven, We'll find soon, who knows, stock market's down a thousand points today uh, <laughs> with coronavirus. Um, but, you know, I think when, when times get tough, people have to figure out how to use data to be data driven, right? And that comes down to every marketing decision, how you're targeting your guests, how you're designing your properties, how you're pricing your properties, where you're investing your properties. You know, so I think, I don't think anything changes, but things, arbitrage opportunities only go one direction, unfortunately. Is that, that is they shrink, right? Arbitrage opportunities only go one direction. I think that's very important to remember, especially as like technology gets better, the data gets better, like you know the how how much it costs to operate properties gets to be cheaper. Like that only shrinks over time, right? And so um, it is more competitive, right? And so I think the expectations have to be you have to be on top of your game on on everything in order to succeed, right? And we see 
I think you'll see a big shuffle up, right? In these bigger property management companies that you know had, had ambitions of having twenty thousand properties under management. You know, I just don't think it's going to happen. And I think that's the one real benefit to the co-host community and small local property manager is this is best run as a small business. It's best run with local knowledge and local talent. And you know, there's only it, it's hard to scale this business, uh, and it's hard to scale it and maintain quality. So I think there are some really there's a bright future for the smaller operators in the, in the planet. You know, still 60% of properties around the world are managed by somebody with less than five properties. And I don't see, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think that a lot of these big players are going to hit some tough times as it's sort of uh, not a growth at all cost um, game here in the future. So I'm not sure where I went off of my soliloquy there, but that's, that's my thoughts in the marketplace. So, so you think, you think that we've reached the, the pinnacle of what you'd be able to see uh, on a return for an arbitrage unit, and right now it's more like squeezing a lemon. I know that's not really like you know probably a, a popular sentiment, right? But I do think that there's no real way that the arbitrage opportunity will get bigger over time. Um, there, there is no way, and so you still have to be thinking about you know your three year plan to zero arbitrage, right? I do think that there's a there's always going to be arbitrage because it's hard, right? There's, there's risk, right? So there's always going to be arbitrage. But it is the only arbitrage that would exist is for people that can manage this really cheaply, really efficiently, really effectively, and figure out a process to still make that arbitrage opportunity work. Because that's the only reason it, it, it probably still exists in a lot of markets is because, one, there's risk, and two, it's hard, and they don't want to figure it out. So they're willing to sort of like let that arbitrage opportunity exist in the margin. So, so what you're saying is that a property, um, even though you might not be able to get uh, a super high return, what, what people need to start doing in the future is figuring out how can they uh, lower their operating costs? How can they save money uh, on their expenses, um, use economies of scale to be able to uh, pull as much profit out of a property? Because right now, uh, the only on the, on the, on the profit side, it's, it's just going to go down. I, I would imagine so. And I think that's, that's the perfect explanation. Um, and I think... That's why people are dumping tons of money into Sonder and Domeo and Stay Off, right? And Lyric is because this does work well in economies of scale. It works much better if you have 200 units in a building than if you have two in 100 different units, right? That doesn't work well, right? And so that is the, that is the rationale between this investment and them. Is this is a hard problem to solve. And if you can solve it really well, really efficiently, there is a nice more arbitrage opportunity to capitalize on. But it does only come in economies of scale if you think three, five plus years down the road. And are you doing anything to be able to cater uh, AirDNA and the type of data that's available for, like like we were talking about with co-hosting, uh, people that maybe are interested in purchasing properties and turning those into short-term rentals? Uh, is that information that you can pull from AirDNA or um, is it are you, are you not catering towards that specific uh, demographic or market? Yeah, so currently we sort of only get down to the market level, right? Here's the right zip code, and we think two bedrooms in the zip code are the best, one of the best investments in the US. We will be launching in the next few weeks, like our sort of really solid attempt at like answering this question in the US um, for best place to invest and all of the things you need to think about too, but to invest in that property. We're also making some moves into how do we get people. Investing in short-term rentals is hard. It's hard because, okay, great. Let's just call Moab, Utah, the best place to invest. Great. I live in Pennsylvania. Like, I don't know anybody in Moab. Who's the agent? What's the broker? How am I going to get lending? Like, what's that all about? Who's the property manager, right? And so we do know that problem exists. And we um, aren't ready to reveal what we're doing there yet. But uh, stay tuned. We are making some investments in that space. Very interesting. So you, you guys are, tr are maybe positioning yourself to become uh, a hub for people that are looking to invest so that they could get connected with the right people, have the right tools, uh, and then also be able to price their properties the right way. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think we, you know, we can't fight the tide, but I think we really realized that this is re the, the short term rentals is a really a new asset class, as they say in real estate. Right. And so it, it is something that is here to stay. Um, and we have the best data to help people buy those properties. We just can't start to take our customers, think about the customer journey, like, great, go buy in Moab, good luck, 
You know, like, you know, that's not a great customer experience. So how do we get them to know who the specialist is there? Who's the best property manager? How to select from them? Where are creative uh, lenders that will maybe give you in a sweet loan if you have another property or you can prove what its rental income is going to be? You know, and so all of those things, I think, are really, uh, if you look at a real customer journey, what you need to solve. And so we need to help not just solve people manage their property, but find the next property that they want to manage and kind of create this virtuous circle where it's like helping you operate it and price it and benchmark it and then find your next property and then do it all over again. And sort of what's that flywheel that you can create for the customer? So kind of, kind of like the, the credit karma for the Airbnb space. Sure. I'll take it. I'll use that. <laughs> all right. And is, is AirDNA um, uh, also available for, let's say people wanted to invest in overseas. Is that something that people can use it for? Yes, I mean, our data, I, I really try to make everything we do at AirDNA like very global in nature. So, you know, we do track every property globally. Um, on the real estate side of things, just it is harder, right? Because there isn't Zillow's and Trulia's and Redfin's out there, right? There are just differing degree of quality and comprehensiveness of real estate data. And so I think right now, we're, you know, on the actual investing side, we've got to just sort of figure out the model in the US and then, you know, maybe go to Canada, go to Australia, go to the UK where there are options, but it gets complicated. It gets complicated once you get out of the US um, just because the availability, the cost, the data, and, and just how good is it? <laughs> it's just, it's a big question mark. So, um, you know, the short-term rental data is just as good, but, you know, the users would have to sort of have a different way of getting whatever the home price value data is or the rental price data and do that sort of... Uh, mashing up that information there themselves at this point. So so is are, are you saying that when you're analyzing properties outside of the US, you're having to look at different uh, data points or you have to scrape different information or is it is it the same? It's the same when we're thinking of like Airbnb and VRBO, right? We can understand what that short term rental revenue is for that property. I just can't tell you in Nice, France, is that good? I don't know. Is that like a terrible place to invest? Because every property is three million dollars and you're only gonna do sixty thousand dollars in revenue. I don't, I don't know, right? And so I don't have that cost basis to sort of build into these best places to invest. I can just say, hey, it's growing fast. It has high occupancy rate. I don't know. It has high revenue, uh, but it's in Monte Carlo. Never mind. It's a terrible place to invest, right? And so that's that's the hard part about the international piece is just having that sort of cost base in the real estate. So so uh, the same the same. I, I I guess are you are you. Because what you're saying is for the investor, like if you're purchasing a property, but are you pulling that information for uh, like the rental, uh, the rental, like the average daily rate for different properties overseas, or is that not something you're doing yet? Yes. Yeah, so, sorry if I'm not being clear. So any of the data that you would see in market miners, the exact same today as it is in the U.S. and international. We cover 130,000 different markets. Market miners, the exact same product as New York City or Zimbabwe. It's just the exact same same product. Um, but when we think about you know the future of how do we help target <clears throat> the best place to invest, we're talking about our investment explorer product, which is a product that does exactly this, compares Zillow home values versus our air our, our, our DNA data. That just doesn't exist outside the US because we don't know what homes cost elsewhere at this point in time. So, so you guys are moving into the space where you'll actually be able to look at an individual property and say, uh, what the return on the investment will be based off of the purchase price? If you do plan on short-term renting it, sure. Yeah, we have a product right now. It's one of our. It's one of our beautiful little babies. It's called Rentalizer, and you put in any address in the world, and we will tell you what that property will do over the next twelve months. Now, do you know what a property earns in revenue? You probably know better than most. Is is very highly subjected to. A lot of things, right? How do you decorate it? How do you manage it? How do you market it? How do you price it? Like what all that stuff, right? So looking at the comps in the area, triangulating based on how they're doing, how similar they are, you know, we'll give you an estimate of what that property would would do. And now in the US will be a lot more accurate, right? Because we know that one, two, three Main Street is worth eight hundred thousand dollars, and we can look at the other comps and sort of triangulate based on the intrinsic intrinsic value of that property, where in Madrid, Spain. I don't know. It's close by. I don't know if this one has the ocean view and this one has a view of the, the gutter over there. I don't know. So like the, the accuracy will always be a little bit uh, less accurate outside the US. But what I'm asking is like with, with a property, if you were to put in the address, the, the rentalizer, I don't believe it. It's actually showing you if you purchase a property for, let's say, 500000 this property could short-term rent potentially for, let's say, 
you know, uh, $200 a night uh, for that 80 for the average daily rate. Thus, your return on investment for that property uh, could be X amount. So Rentalizer will tell you what the revenue ADR occupancy would be of that property. And we are building up little fun calculators to put in there. Um, so what you can figure out your cap rate or your cash on cash return, you can build in some basic estimates. Uh, that's probably about 30 days out. So that, that calculators are easy, right? Like once you got revenue cost, like now it's just like, what do you want to bake in for property management, for maintenance? Oh, you got a pool, crank it up, insurance, whatever. Like those are, those are easy. And so we do know that the, End user does want to sort of just see some more of that, so we are building that out currently in the, inside the rentalizer product. Awesome, and and uh, just just kind of wrapping up. I mean, uh, you're where, where do you where do you see short term renting going in the future? I know that there's a lot of people that are coming into the space, a lot of new uh, management companies, a lot of people like Sondra Lyric that are you know capitalizing on the rental arbitrage. Uh, but where do you see it in like five or ten years? Because you mentioned before, you know, uh, if you're looking at a property, you kind of have to have that three year mindset. You know, how 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 long can an arbitrage property go for? But do you think that this is something that could be going for 10, 20 years? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I wish I had like, you know, better news. I mean, I think that there is a, there's a time frame where we'll see just the natural evolution and professionalization of an industry, which has been traditionally very antiquated, right? In terms of how they manage properties, look at competition, price their properties. So you'll see this proliferation of new tools, better tools, more automation, that will help the local operator sort of stay up to speed for a while. But in, I mean, I don't, it's <laughs> become a bit jaded running a company lately because you sort of see that the, the cards are always going to be stacked against the small guy, against the small operator. When you think about regulations, or you think about technology enforcements, when you think about like how you have to buy a whole multifamily building to get Airbnbs in it, you can't just rent one anymore. You got to buy the whole building. That's not, you know, plausible for me and you, right? And so, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be doomsday, but, you know, commercial is, you know, when this gets really popular and as this becomes a really a better way to monetize space, it will only sort of get the big boys in here, right? You know, get Blackstone in to go buy all the properties and then put them all on Airbnb and have them be all on board. And so, you know, I think just stay tuned for that because, you know, as companies like Invitation Homes or created like residential homes as an asset class, you will see people coming in with billions of dollars to buy short-term rentals. The one thing they'll never want to do is operate those short-term rentals. I don't think, right? They don't want to do the maintenance on it. They don't want to do anything related to the maintenance and operations of that property. So I think there's still and always will be an opportunity for local operators to have very, very beautiful and profitable businesses. But the real estate side of things, um, you know, I think we'll be gobbled up by, you know, much more institutional investors than, than ourselves at some point in time. So, so you're saying that in the future, the arbitrage model is going to be maybe squeezed out a little bit by these big operators that are just picking up properties and they don't, they don't care about maybe uh, as, as large of a margin as a smaller operators are looking for. Um, and the co-host model is maybe more, more in line with, uh, for future profitability. Yeah, so I, yeah, I don't really know how you define your co-host model, right? If your co-host model is rent to, you know, renting a five-bedroom home in Myrtle Beach and like having that as, as a property, I mean, I think it's a beautiful business, right? And I think it's a beautiful business to not have a real job, you know, be a second income winner and have that be a really nice income stream. Uh, if you're thinking about how co-host, like how I always think about it is get, you know, 20 people in a building and rent those one bedrooms out. I just think, you know, metropolitan markets, big cities, small operators, you know, obtuse building owners, bad neighbors, like just like just I feel like that model is is going to have more challenges. Um, so it just depends on how you sort of uh, classify co-host, I would say. I, I still like traditional vacation rental markets, large homes, group travel. I think that's all going to have a really rosy future. Um, but hotel comparable stays in cities, you know, I think, unfortunately, the hotel lobby is too powerful and continue to win those battles in the top like sort of 25 cities around the US. Where, where do you see where do you see us in this cycle? If you could kind of say like if you started back in 2012 and you're you're kind of projecting in the future that, you know, more people are going to come into the space. Uh, where where are where do you see us right now uh, for arbitrage investors? Where do I see you guys in the cycle? You know, I think 
I don't think your cycle is any different than the general hospitality cycle, right? I think we're all going to live and die the same, 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 same life and death, right? And it really is unknown at this point in time. I think the unknown is we know hotels are at the end of their cycle. It is known. It's pretty much a fact. And if it wasn't a fact yesterday with coronavirus and all that stuff, it's a fact, right? The cycle is sort of over. It's another 12 years of having increased year over year ADR, occupancy, rep park growth has now finally ended. Right. And so that is interesting. I think what we don't know is how tightly correlated short term rentals are to hotels. Right. Um, obviously, you can make a case for business travel to one bedrooms in New York City. That's going to be tightly correlated. But, you know, uh, we don't really know. And there are a lot of theories out there that maybe short term rentals are more resilient. Right. Because they're more like maybe drive to towns. Maybe they're more affordable sort of uh, vacations. Um, and maybe traveling in groups is also a better discount to like actually have a great stay at a cheaper price. And so I think it's still unknown in terms of like how much they are correlated or not. And so I, I, I don't like to pontificate on things I don't know much about. <laughs> and it would just be a total guess at this point in time. I'd say. Look, looking at the data, w- w- would basically would, would seeing the profit um, kind of shrink be an indicator of the the uh, the lifeline of the arbitrage model? And have you seen the profits uh, shrinking down pretty dramatically recently? Or is it pretty steady? I, I don't actually have the real numbers on that. I would say we do launch this thing called the STR index. And it's something we launch quarterly at this point in time, which sort of shows year over year, month over month, by city. And we sort of rank metropolitan market, markets and traditional vacational markets. Just what we're seeing in terms of revenue, how is the index moving? It's been pretty flat over the last year. I'd say we're having like just tremendous growth. Like, well, go check out the index, but like 30, uh, 40% growth over the previous uh, two to three years. And so I think we see it flattening out. And that is just because, you know, their supply and demand are just growing much more congruently now, right? Like people know, like, oh, okay, cool. Like, oh, this is doing great. Well, let me add two more. And they're like, oh, now it's not doing as well. So I'll stop adding properties, right? So it's just a much more like dynamic and, and like much more rational marketplace now. Um, and so I wouldn't say that like it's going to go down. I just think I see it sort of like relatively flat as supply continues to catch demand uh, for travel uh, in the course of the future. Do, do you see in uh, other other markets that maybe are not outpacing uh, the the demand, like are there particular areas? Because like right now, a lot of people and a lot of the highlights uh, on all these reports are m- more metropolitan areas. But are there other markets where um, the you know you still can see that three times return off of that investment? Yeah, New York City, <laughs> but that's the problem, right? And then every time I sort of find a city, I'm like, whoa, that's a cool new city. I'm like, oh, right, like like Charleston, like you know, like oh, Charleston looks great. Oh yeah, that's you know, can't go there. And so, you know, I, I just tell a lot of people that are like, hey, I just need the license to be on for 12 months. I'm looking for a quick hit and I'm going to go to Charleston and I'm going to go like bribe the guy who owns the, the property and I'm going to go put a fake name in there. That's not a sustainable business. But, you know, there is always this, sort of this what is it, balance between risk and reward that's going on in the market. And so anytime you go to a top 20 city, if there's always going to be risk. You know, even if we thought Phoenix was fine and then Phoenix now is going to be like 90 day cap all of a sudden and people dump, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in that market. Um, there's nothing that's completely certain. Uh, <laughs> I'm not doing a great job. You're running a co-host business, by the way, but uh, you know, it is, it is what it is, man. It's a nascent industry. It's growing quickly. There's lots of opportunities, but you know, it's, it's hard to see exactly outside of places that have been vacation rentals since the beginning of time. Their whole economy is based off of tourism. You know, I think you, you know the sustainable investors going there, and the other people, you know, are honestly looking at international or some other options outside the U.S. at this point in time. So, so you're seeing international. There, there's a lot more potential gain. I think, yeah, I think there definitely is. Yeah, there's just yeah, I've got an office in Barcelona. Like, it's just you know, it's just a different game. The U.S. just in terms of like taking risk, having like you know, being at the cutting edge of something, like really trying to figure out. You know, something that's innovative, a new model. It just isn't there as much as it is here. Um, and even in Barcelona, where it exploded in Paris, like they had these massive, you know, they had massive unemployment. So people are always going to be scraping by trying to find a good business opportunity. They just aren't as, ref- I just think not as professional as some of the, the US operations I've seen. 
But if you think about like Central America or South America, like there's just there's lots of opportunities everywhere. And I just sort of noticed that US is, you know, it makes it might, may, may sound bad for all my European customers, but they're sort of five years ahead of the curve. And so there's always an opportunity when you start looking in, you know, Mexico and San Miguel or like, you know, there's always going to be opportunities outside the U.S. What's the most revealing thing that you that you've seen uh, from analyzing all this data? Like if there was something that was just like, wow, I, I just was, you know, no, nobody else knows this. Um, <laughs> the one thing I've been keeping for your show here, Julian. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, what is the most interesting thing I've, I've seen? Um God, I don't know if I've got a really amazing nugget for you. Um, I think I think the one thing that is interesting is that I, I've, I, we're doing some research on it right now is that short-term rentals are moving markets in a way that nobody's really looking at or analyzing. And by that, I mean home values are either rising to meet what is the sort of revenue generated by those vacation rentals, right? Or if regulation goes into place, sinking really quickly to sort of to have this like glutton uh, of supply in the marketplace. And nobody in the sort of the real estate market is really analyzing exactly like what is the impact of real estate, like in Palm Springs, when they made it illegal and, you know, a thousand properties came on the market overnight or the opposite, like in Galveston, Texas or in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, where there's still like an amazing margin there, how quickly real estate values are, are, are catching up to what is that cap rate in the marketplace. And so I think that's a, I don't know if that's a really fantastical stat, but I think it's something that's underappreciated is that short-term rentals are moving markets in a way where home values are very dependent upon what the short-term rental activity is in those markets. So, so, so just to kind of wrap this up is what you're saying is that, um, that there's, there's a lot of opportunity in people being able to purchase properties and seeing a return that people really aren't uh, looking at because right now a lot of people are just thinking the arbitrage space. You know, how, can, how much can I rent a place for? How much can I get uh, for the profit? But what you're saying is that people maybe aren't looking at uh, the the power of purchasing a property and the return that that can bring in. No, I mean, so I mostly work with people buying buying properties, right? And so what what we're basically saying is that you can always bake in general appreciation for a property, but if you're buying the properties in the right places, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, or Destin, Florida, or uh, whatever it might be, that you, we can sort of predict more appreciation of that property as more people buy, noticing that they can get a good cash flow out of these assets, uh, that you know, we can predict there to be another 10, 15, 20% rise in home values as you know, people are thinking about real estate, not just as sort of tr- traditional valuations, but as a cash flow commercial business, it has a new valuation. And so residential real estate that can be short-term rental you know, will eventually be valued more like commercial real estate with a rent roll, with cap rates, with cash flows, and all that thing. And so that's sort of the interesting trend I, I'm, I'm finding it should be a part of now is as, uh, you know, as real estate sort of being valued like commercial properties and what that does for valuations around the U.S. And, and AirDNA is planning on being the tool that can help you uh, analyze those properties like that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll awesome. be there. We'll be there for you. Is, is there is there a time timeline for that one? Uh, I mean, I think over the next three months, you know. So it's uh, February now. So by the summertime, we're gonna have a lot of we're gonna have a lot of cool tools. We must help people buy the properties, but do further analysis and calculators and, and all those sort of fun things. Awesome, awesome. And I think I think people would lynch me if I didn't ask you this, but where where should people be? Uh, and where where's Scott cool. Shafford investing in his yeah. uh, his properties? Yeah, yeah, that question. Yeah, no, it's you know, it's, it's a great question. I'm terrible. I have a terrible answer, right? It's like it's in the blog post. It's not a secret. I don't carry around like the three markets that I really like in my back pocket. It just is what it is. Um, so go check out the blog post. Like I said, we're gonna be coming out really deep dive soon. Um, so I sorry, no spoilers here. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll include I'll I'll include a link in the description uh, as well as for those that are interested in um, in uh, checking out Air DNA. But uh, I just want to thank you so much, Scott. Do you have anything else that you wanted to share before we we end this conversation? No, I'm good. Yeah, everybody, come check out the website AirDNA.co. I mean, we've got a lot of good blog content. All of our content's free in our Market Minder products. So go go check it out. And uh, you know, hit me up on social media or Facebook uh, if you have any complaints or praises. Um, I'm here to hear them. All right. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, coming on the show. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. 
Hope you host benefited from the show. If you found value, please go on over to iTunes, leave us a review, and let us know what you enjoy about the show. If you'd like to talk to hosts that have been featured in these episodes as well as the community, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. 